Okay, does that work? Okay. So hello everyone. Uh, so my name is Pierre Glazer. Uh, I work at INRIA, uh, which is a, so a research institute uh, in France. And actually, most of my team uh, does like research and machine learning for neuroimaging data. Uh, but there is a small subset actually in this team of uh, Ninja uh, that work mostly on open source projects. And you must know them because, uh, I mean, a bunch of them maintain the scikit-learn library, machine learning. And actually, my job uh, is to like improve the performance, uh, like among other stuff, of uh, Psychic learn uh, when it's asked to do tasks in parallel, either multiprocessing, multithreading, or multi-machine. Uh, so I'm going to talk about like how uh, we collaborate with the whole ecosystem, uh, NumPy, Python, uh, and a bunch of other libraries uh, to make uh, multiprocessing and multi-machine uh, computation faster for everyone. Uh, so the the first uh, section will be basically like a walkthrough about like why uh, parallel processing is important in machine learning. Um, then the second part is kind of going to be a catalog of all the like different libraries that you'll see uh, that do like uh, multiprocessing and that scikit-learn, for example, uses. Uh, and then the last part actually will be like like the most like bleeding edge advances that we actually push forwards in Python 3.8, and that hopefully you'll yeah, be able to benefit from. Uh, okay, so I'm just realizing this doesn't fit well, but uh, anyway, so Python. Hopefully, by the third day of your Python, you guys all know that Python is. You know, mo like used by at least a decent part of the users to do like data analytics and machine learning. Uh, I think Python is really cool to do like basically interactive development and like fast iteration of like data analysis. Uh, so uh, there is like I don't know a huge um, like ecosystem of open source libraries that got a lot of momentum in the last ten years. Uh, NumPy uh, that's used like by the recent metrics by two hundred thousand people, pandas, and of course I could learn. Um, and actually. So I, this is for the whole like data analysis presentation. Why is like parallel computing so important in machine learning? Uh, I think it's because uh, parallel uh, computation happens kind of a lot in machine learning because machine learning at the core is kind of statistics, and in statistics you tend to repeat independent operation to make stuff more robust, like to uncertainties and to a bunch of stuff. And uh, sometimes you kind of want to span a space to explore also, uh, and so. What we call this like, kind of independent computation that we can run completely independently, we call them embarrassingly parallel tasks. And so embarrassingly parallel tasks happens a lot, as I said, in machine learning. They happen like in cross-validation, random forest. Random forest, for example, you want to fit a model. Uh, like, uh, and a model consists of a bunch of trees. So you kind of want to fit all these trees completely independently. Uh, and so, I mean, completely like, uh, conceptually speaking, Distributing this task is not like shouldn't be a burden, right? Because like you have all these tasks completely independent from each other. You have resources like let's say workers, processes, machines, or anything, and you want to distribute them. So I mean, there is no communication between the processes. Like it's it's technically super easy, and it, it should be made I think easy for the users like using Scikit-Learn that would like to enable like machine learning in their code. And so, as a conclusion, I think parallelization in Scikit-Learn is completely ubiquitous. And it's super easy to enable. Like, let's say, for example, you want to train a random forest classifier. Uh, you can train it on four cores uh, simply by using the NJobs parameter. So, I mean, you know, it's a one-liner. It's super easy. Um, now, to get into a little bit more details, uh, so I think there is a little bit overlapping of this talk with other talks, maybe a little bit the talk of Victor. Uh, but I still get a, a little bit, you know, kind of dive into it to make sure everyone here is up to date with that. Uh, parallelism on a single machine. Uh, exists under like two different forms. You can either create different processes, so basically create different Python programs that will have their own memory space, uh, or you can have one second Python program executing different threads in parallel. Uh, so actually, kind of spawning multiple threads in one single Python program seems like the smart way, right? Because like I don't know, you sp like sp save memory, uh, you have everything like in a single process, it's lighter. So why don't we use all threads, right? Uh, like in this example here, like you have like I don't know, for example, three threads. Uh, that all like have to fit, uh, for example, um, different trees of a random forest, and so they all kind of point to the same data, right? So to fit the model here, they always have the same data. Um, but actually, the problem here uh, is that Python, in general, kind of forces threads to run sequentially. So it's not always the case, right? For example, if you use NumPy or SciPy, uh, NumPy or SciPy are like written in native code, and so because they're running native code, they can release uh, this global interpreter log that prevents the thread from running in parallel. Uh, but I mean. You can always like hope for it, but it will not happen all the time, right? When you create like your own Python program, you don't know in advance unless you dig into the source code of the co like the libraries you use. You don't know in advance whether or not like your threads are gonna be able to run in parallel or sequentially. I think kind of the safe way to enable parallelism in the code 
is actually to run process-based parallelism. So you have different Python processes with their different memory space, and because they're completely independent process, if you have multiple cores of your new machine, you can actually ensure that like different sequences of Python bytecode are actually going to run in parallel. And that's asymptotically, if your code is CPU bound and not I/O bound, like you're going to get a speed up. Uh, so like this scheme just illustrates how many different copies you have to make of the data because at this point all processes have different memory space. Uh, so you have to like dump your data to all the memory space of the different processes, which I mean has two overhead. First, it like increases the memory footprint. Uh, of your program, enough of like a generally like a bunch more of data just hang out in the RAM. And also uh, there is kind of uh, overhead uh, of transferring the data from the main process uh, to the other, which can, you know, uh, be kind of long, um, especially if the data is very large. Uh, there is, I mean, shared memory is a thing, and it's probably going to be a thing in 3.8. It also was a thing before, but you guys probably didn't know it because it was kind of hidden. Uh, not in the, even in the standard library, just through like some kind of weird hacks that we used to do in scikit-learn. So we used to enable shared memory between processes. Um, but let's not too talk too much about that because it just adds like some more complexity. Uh, just guys letting you know that you know it's a thing, and hopefully it also kind of helps to make multiprocessing faster. Um, this graph uh, is a graph of benchmarks of uh, different model fitting of scikit-learn models. Uh, so it's a 2D graph. So basically, each point in this graph represents one machine learning model. Uh, the x-axis is the time it took to fit this model sequentially. And the y-axis is how long it took to fit this model using four different workers. So I mean, you would accept most of the points in this graph right, to be close to the green line, because the green line represents like, the ideal speed up. So the green line, the equation is y equal x uh, divided by 4. So it's basically the ideal speed up that you can expect from running a model in parallel between running a model with one worker. So hopefully all the points are distributed along this line. Of course, it's not going to be the case because you're going to have all the um, like data passing and stuff. But hopefully we can hope that. Uh, in practice, it's here. So you also notice two colors here. You have purple points and yellow points. Uh, the yellow points are like points where the um, parallel backend was processes. So we didn't run different threads. We ran different pr Python processes. Uh, the purple points were points where the parallel instances were threads. And as you can see, not all the points are completely distributed close to the green line. Most of the points are in a kind of good enough zone, that's the green zone, right? They're close to the like, optimal speed up we can get. But some of these points, and you'll notice it's only purple points, are like far away, kind of outliers, and the red line here represents the point past this red line, like above this red line, we actually have no speed up from fitting a model using like different workers. So this is like worse than like these points represent cases where fitting a model using different worker is worse than fitting the model sequentially. So this could be considered as bug, but as you see, it's only like purple points. So this represents typically global interpreter lock contention uh, that can exist in Python. So I think like the kind of takeaway of this graph is that process-based parallelism will always, I mean asymptotically can appropriate a speed up is the data is not too big and running your model is not too slow. Um, sorry, it's not too fast. Um, and that's why I think uh, we have to like kind of focus also on making multiprocessing faster uh, is because it's for now kind of the safe way to enable multi um, parallel processing in Python. And also I think there are like many different concepts, like many improvements that you do when you improve multiprocessing. Um, you also improve multi-machine. Uh, because the concepts are the same, you have to pass data around between machine, between process, it doesn't matter so much. <laughs> so as soon as you do an improvement for multiprocessing, you do also an improvement for multi-machine execution. Um, the second part of this talk is going to be more of like kind of a catalog of all the libraries that provide um, um, multiprocessing uh, possibilities in your code. But I mean, more than a catalog, I think it kind of represents uh, the development workflow that my team did. Uh, when they wanted to actually have multiprocessing code run in scikit-learn, right? They started from using like standard library libraries, such as multiprocessing, and then realized that sometimes it was just not enough. So we ended up kind of creating our own, and then build upon it to make it like super easy for data scientists. I think the m like you know, also key takeaway of this part. I'm sorry, I'm doing the conclusion before even I run the slides. But the key takeaway of this part, I think, is to realize that a lot of stuff we do was kind of to ease the development, like the the, the usage of multiprocessing code for data scientists. Um, first, so let's talk about the standard library. Uh, in the standard library, there is a module that causes a lot of pain to people, like making sure that, like Python runs on different platforms. Uh, it's called multiprocessing. So multiprocessing is kind of like a huge module providing like wrappers around like system code, like um, sorry, system calls, 
um, to like create processes uh, and to make those processes communicate. So you can like create a bunch of data structures to make the process communicate. You can create the processes. Uh, so like for example, you can create queues and also you can synchronize the processes using logs. It's a very very rich library, but it's also kind of a low level library. And I think when you think about like embarrassingly parallel tasks, so embarrassingly parallel is just independent computation run one after like uh, can, that can be run completely in parallel with no com without, sorry with no um, communication between the workers. I think multiprocess like parallelizing um, embarrassingly parallel task programs have completely a common structures. Like technically, what you want to do is to create a queue. Uh, queue all the tasks that you want to parallelize, uh, to want to parallelize embarrassingly, uh, spawn a bunch of workers that will just get tasks from that queue, and then have the workers send back the result to the main process. And this happens wh whatever your use case is, as soon as you deal with embarrassingly parallel tasks. So I think this should be abstracted away, and I mean, I didn't think that, multiprocessing developers solved that. And so actually they created a class, which is called the worker pool, so the mp.pool class, that abstracts all of this away, and with which you interact when you want to run embarrassingly parallel tasks. So let's say, for example, I want to greet all my friends. I have two friends only, Alice and Bob. So I kind of, kind of map these greetings using the pool. Pool.map, greet Alice and Bob. And then here, that runs in parallel. And you don't have to create a queue. You don't have to create <laughs> processes. It all happens completely smoothly. The problem with multiprocessing is that in some cases, it's not super portable. Um, I'm, I think sometimes we forget Windows because I, I think, I mean, for example, I like develop on Linux. Uh, but actually, a lot of data scientists, they run on Windows. And uh, what data scientists do on a day-to-day -day basis is interact with Jupyter Notebook. So what happens usually is they launch a notebook in the browser, and then they just run code, uh, and then interact with it. So they run their code, they figure out that's not exactly what they want, they rerun cells, and then they run machine learning models. But everything that happens in a Jupyter Notebook happens in an interactive session. And the problem with multiprocessing is that it's not super good at parallelizing code that was created in interactive session. And actually, when I'm not saying it's not super good, it's just it's not possible. Um, <laughs> uh, so that, that, that's the first big concern. I mean, I think, I, mean, I don't have the correct numbers, but I think like 50% of the scikit-learn users are on Windows. So we cannot really like let them away, you know. Um, another problem is that even on POSIX system, actually, uh, the way to start processes is not, I think, POSIX compliant. It only uses forks and not exec afterwards. Uh, so it actually causes crash with some external libraries that are very useful when you want to enable performance in your code, uh, and especially the GNU version of OpenMP. So this is another problem, and that doesn't happen on Windows, it happens on POSIX systems. Uh, and also, multiprocessing pools are like not super user-friendly when it comes to like worker unexpected crashes. So crash like workers can suddenly crash, for example, if they take fault or if they consume too much memory, they can be killed by the OS. And in this point, Multiprocessing pools are just going to wait for them to finish where they're just crashed. So they're never going to finish. They're going to chill out until you know, it control C or something, which is not great. Uh, so because of all these problems, uh, we decided to... And I mean, these were like kind of problems at the core, and it was not super easy to fix them upstream. So we kind of decided to actually like, create a bunch, like uh, a whole new library from scratch. Uh, this library is not created from scratch, actually. It's created from concurrent filters, but I'm not going like, to talk about that. Uh, so this library we created, um, and that's actually used by scikit-learn, is called Loki. So Loki is another library that provides worker pool access. Uh, so it's a third-party packages. Uh, it supports all Python version. Uh, hopefully, we're going to stop support for Python 2.7, so please, guys, update to Python 3. Uh, it has consistent behaviors on like Linux, uh, on Mac OS, and of course uh, on Windows, and it works on interactive shells. So I mean, it's the way to go if you want to parallelize code uh, for uh, that's used by data scientists. Because, and I cannot stress this enough, like working interactively is the key uh, advantage of Python, uh, and we have to support it. Um, Loki API for worker pools is kind of the same as another p library in the standard library that's called Concurrent Futures. Uh, so. I would say it's a drop-in replacement, <laughs> although I'm not like 100% sure. Uh, at least the syntax is very, very similar. So for example, here uh, you parallelize uh, a task using uh, like uh, concurrent features, and here you parallelize, that parallelize a task using Loki. It's basically the same syntax, right? Why we, we use concurrent feature and not Loki? Same, concurrent features have some problems like on interactive session and et cetera. So we cannot use concurrent feature. We have to create a new library. Uh, it's not because we like to code, it's because we have to. Um, finally, the last part of this like huge catalog uh, of different libraries is called. Uh, um, I'm going to introduce you guys to Joblib. 
so job leave is a library that's built on top of Loki, uh, and that's what's created to kind of ease the development workflow of data scientists. Uh, job leave is actually what interacts with scikit-learn and scikit-learn codes. Scikit-learn doesn't interact directly with Loki, it interacts with, with, with job leave when it wants to parallelize tasks. Uh, and so it's a parallel computing library, uh, and in, among the like, very cool feature that it includes, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, I think the, the, the killer one that actually I didn't know when I started using it is this bad memoization. So basically, if you want to parallelize a bunch of tasks that are CPU bound that, that take a lot of time, uh, and let's say, for example, I don't know, you want to, so th this example is going to be stupid, but you want to greet a thousand friends, right? And so you start greeting all your friends in parallel, and, and uh, at some point, like at the 500 friends, you crash, right? Well, Joblib is going to remember that you did all those tasks that maybe, you know, it may take a lot of time to read your friend, you're going to ask them, or their kids, or they, et cetera, et cetera. So it may take a lot of time. And Joblib actually, like, got all these results from these tasks and stored them into disk. So if for some reason the call to Joblib kind of failed in the middle where you were executing a bunch of tasks, all of the results that you already computed will be stored in disk. And so if you rerun the call, you won't have to actually rerun all the tasks. All the tasks that you already ran, you all only have to like get the result from the disk, and the tasks that you didn't run already, well, you have to run them. <coughs> but so actually, this is re really, really useful. Uh, another useful feature of Joblib that's not into Loki is like optimized transfer of NumPy array. As I said, like data scientists always work with NumPy arrays, um, and if you want to actually enable good speed up from multiprocessing, you have to like make sure transferring NumPy array is not taking too much time. So Joblib takes that in account, and also has kind of a backend agnostic user API, so it's really easy to switch from a threading backend to a multiprocessing backend, and here is a like, two-line code snippet that show you how to do it. Um, so that was it. Uh, the last part of this talk, I absolutely don't know how much time I have left. Okay, 10 minutes is great. Uh, so the, the last part of this talk is gonna get a little bit more involved. Uh, it's about like, what happened recently in the multiprocessing community in Python, and what were the problems in, uh, in this community that we actually managed to fix, uh, not social-wise, but code-wise. Um, so, from now on, I think you understood that uh, what's important uh, when doing multiprocessing and when constructing multiprocessing code is making sure that the data you transfer from process to another are transferred fast. And also, because you have so many processes that hold like, the same copies of the data, making sure that the footprint of the overall system of workers is not so, he so high. So these are, the, I think, the, the, the two main things I worked on from the last year. And also, a uh, last thing, it's ease of use, typically like pool hanging, uh, because like worker crashes or everything. But I'm not, gonna call, I'm not gonna talk too much about this last point. I'm gonna talk about the first two points. Um, one disclaimer before I start. This is all about C Python. I'm sorry uh, for the PyPy folks from the Iron Python or anything. This is all about C Python. Um, maybe actually this other implementation don't even have those problems. I don't know. Um, so when you actually want to like transfer data from one process to another, you have to do an operation that's called serialization. So think about when you run a Python program, you have a bunch of objects that are in memory, right? And this object, they kind of form what we call an object graph, right? Because an object can hold a reference to another object. I don't know, like I'm a, I am an instance of a class and I have an attribute that's like another instance of this class. So you'll have kind of a link between the two vertices that has this object. And so at the end, if you look at the complete memory layout of your Python program, it's a big, huge object graph, right? And so my use case is I have an object in one process and I want to like send it to another process. What you have to do if you want to create like serialization for this process is to make sure all the objects that are present in the object graph and that are leaked at some point to the object you want to serialize are also properly serialized. So serialization is kind of a recursive operation where you make sure all objects that are linked to the object you want to serialize are also serialized. And at the end, you eat completely atomic objects that don't hold any reference to other objects, so such like integers. Integers don't hold any reference. So they're kind of like the leaves of the graph, you know? Um, it's not a graph, it's a tree at this point, but no, it's not, I'm, uh, <laughs> But anyway, so th th this little scheme like, kind of illustrates what you want to do. You want to get an object and then you want to convert it to a format that's suitable for inter-process communication. Uh, bytes is a good uh, format for inter-process communication. So here I have an estimator, maybe like of a scikit-learn class, uh, and I'm serializing it into a bunch of bytes, and then these bytes, I don't know, can be sent into a pipe, and got back for another process that will recreate this estimator by executing the instructions that are contained 
int this byte. Um, this whole thing, of course, you don't have to do it, right? Uh, there is a module in the standard library that does it for you. It's called Pickle. Uh, actually, Pickle is a protocol, and uh, the Pickle module is an implementation of this protocol. And so here is a very simple code snippet where I have a list of three elements. Uh, I can serialize in using pickle.dumps, and then I have a sequence of bytes, right? And if I launch a completely different Python process of the snippet uh, in the, uh, below, is a, can be a completely independent Python process, uh, I send him this bunch of bytes, and uh, using pickle.load, I can completely recreate the original object. So this kind of illustrates the point that you know, from one process to another, I sent a list. So that, that's pretty cool. Um, but the problem with uh, the pickle implementation that's presented in the pickle module <coughs> is that by design, it's kind of limited. And it has a, I mean, it's not limited to random stuff, actually, because for random stuff where serialization wasn't introduced, generally, you can submit a patch to upstream and they will be happy. But there is one thing for which develop, like Python developers are really like kind of sensitive and don't want to push that feature, and it's I mean it's understandable. It's not uh, it's not completely irrational, um, but it's not possible with Pickle to send interactively interactively defined function. So let's look back at the workflow from a data scientist. You create a bunch of function and then you want to execute them in parallel and you want to iterate fast. So you don't want to leave uh, a session and then rerun or something. You just want to have a bunch of code cell that you like modify and run on the fly and then send it to workers. And so typically in this situation, Pickle will fail at sending this function. So it's just not possible using the serialization, like the Pickle module, to actually run function in parallel when you're a data scientist working on Jupyter Notebook, especially on Windows. Um, Typically, this example here, uh, when I create a function completely dynamically, that's a lambda, uh, won't work. Sends me a pickling error. I don't know if you've ever seen that error, guys, like when running your code. Uh, it's an error I see a lot of time, uh, but, uh, but it's frustrating. Uh, and so in practice, many distributed computing libraries, and in general, uh, also scikit-learn, uh, they don't rely on pickle internally. They're relying on pickle extension that actually can palliate this problem. Um, to make stuff faster. Not faster, actually, just to, 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 I mean, to make stuff faster ultimately, but just basically to parallelize code. Uh, so in practice, uh, Dask, for example, that's uh, the second logo, or Ray, that's the first logo, scikit-learn, Spark, or Prefect, all those libraries, they don't rely on Pickle internally. They rely on Pickle extensions, such as, for example, Cloud Pickle. Uh, Cloud Pickle here in the last snippet example completely manages like to serialize this function. Um, but the, here's the problem with pickle extensions, actually. Uh, the pickle module uh, so is implemented, actually, in two different ways. It's implemented as a C extension. like it's, so it's, it's in the standard library, but it's, in, it's implemented both in C and in pure Python. And the version in, in C is actually 30 times faster at serializing big objects than the pure Python one. So I mean, when you extend pickle, you don't want to extend the Python version, right? You want to extend the C version, because they all provide the same classes. So at the core, serializing ob objects in Python is like calling methods from the pickler class, and both the C module and the Python module have the same pickler class, but what you want to extend when you run Python, like pickle extension, you want to extend the C pickler class. Um, but sadly, that's not possible. At least that wasn't possible, spoiler alert. Uh, like in Python 3.7, for example here, um, you had, if you were re using Cloud Pickle, to rely on the Pythonic pickler. So let's say I want to serialize a large list. I'm going to take 30 times more using Cloud Pickle that's using Pickle for serializing, serializing the same dumb object. So it's very frustrating, and actually this was causing a lot of slowdown in scikit-learn uh, when sending, I don't know, for example, vocabulary and using TF, IDF, vectorizer, these kind of things. So this was definitely something we had to work on to make it better. Uh, and actually in Python 3.8, Python extensions can no extend the C-optimized Pickle module. So, I mean, this is really an achievement because it helps a lot when like, say, sending large objects, not NumPy array, but large lists or like dicks that typically are attributes of scikit-learn estimators. Um, if we do exactly the same benchmark now in Python 3.8, we'll see that, I mean, the, 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 the increase in speed is not significant. I think the key takeaway here is that the order of magnitude is the same, and it's not one order of magnitude slower using a Cloud Pickle than using Pickle. So this is definitely uh, something that got improved in Python 3.8. Um, one last um, feature, actually, that's even maybe more significant, uh, is the uh, burst of Pickle Protocol 5. So Pickle has a bunch of protocols. Basically, each time you want to do like kind of a huge addition to the Pickle protocol, you have to create a new protocol. There were already like five protocols. Um, and 
the last uh, protocol addition uh, was made by a Python core developer that's called Antoine. Uh, and that re kind of realized, I mean, he was not only to realize, but I mean, a bunch of people realized that Pickle originally was kind of created for like on disk persistent chain of Python objects. So let's say you have Python objects in memory, you want to store them into disk, but it's not how it's used right now. How it's used right now actually is as a way of communicating data between Python workers. So it's not storing objects on disk, it's communicating data. And because it was not thought of that way, the RAM usage was suboptimal. We were making like spurious memory copies. And I mean, it actually causes worker to be killed by the US when taking too much memory. And this was causing tons of deadlock. And it was a pain for like developers of distributed computing libraries such as Dask and Joblib and all the others. Um, so actually, this problem was completely uh, solved uh, in Pickle Protocol 5, thanks to a new addition that's called the Pickle Buffer. It's a low level object that you will never see. Uh, but basically, using Pickle Buffer ensures us that no copy are done when derping or loading like large contiguous buffer uh, that are hold by NumPy arrays and our tables. And so, typically, <coughs> pandas data frame or scikit-learn symmetal that hold references to these objects will be serialized super fast, um, and also with like no overhead uh, of memory or something like that. So, it's really a big addition. But I think it goes like even. One step further, actually, it's not only like uh, main memory optimization or something. Uh, it allows delegation of like the kind of compute heavy part of serialization to third party libraries. So, I mean, you guys probably know what an empire array is, but at its core, an empire array is just a bunch of metadata, like the shape of the empire array, the strides, the flags, and then a huge contiguous data buffer, right? And so, what I want to do personally, uh, when I develop Club Pico, is like, I see this NumPy array coming, and I want to serialize it, and I want, like, when I see all the light subjects, such as, like, the flags, the stride, the shape, I want to give it to Pickle, because Pickle is good as just reconstructing Python objects. But when I see this huge data buffer, I just want to take it and serialize it my own way. And then, in the process, like, that recreates this object, I will take the two streams, the streams that from the pure Pickle, and the streams that I created when I serialized uh, uh, like optimally my, uh, my object. And that's actually what uh, Pickle uh, Protocol 5 also does. It allows what we say out of bounds serialization of big data buffer. Uh, and that's very useful for all um, like uh, distributed computing libraries such as Dask, um, Arrow, uh, and scikit-learn and all of those. So the, it's, it's hard to kind of draw a conclusion. Um, I think what we could have said is that just parallel computing makes stuff faster in general in scikit-learn, that's from what we've seen in this graph. Uh, which backend to use is a, prob like it's a problem specific question. Uh, so you actually have to like try out different of those and to see what works better for you, depending on what bound is your code. And also, working with upstream is worth the hassle. It makes the ecosystem safer, so please guys work with upstream. Thank you very much for the very nice talk. Uh, I've definitely loved a lot. Um, we have time for a few short questions. Um, I didn't understand why the uh, C Python developers then don't care about the interactive users. No, it's <laughs> so it's. I think it's a uh, it's it's a very 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 difficult question. Uh, Actually, a lot of people complain about the security aspects of Pickle. Mm -hmm. uh, Pickle is sorry, kind of known to be like unsafe. And so typically when you define a uh, function interactively, uh, you cannot serialize them as a reference to their module. Because the main module is not present of all of your workers. When you create a function in the main module of a process, you basically, generally, when you serialize function, like for example, I don't know, the exponential function from the math module, when you serialize this function, the byte string will only contain instruction to get back the function from the math module. So it's a very light way. There is no code serialized. But if you actually interactively create a function, there is no way you can get it from the main module of the other process, because it just won't be there. So you have to serialize actually the code. So I mean, when you serialize interactively defined function, you serialize code objects, and you serialize like Python virtual machines instructions. And this can be seen somewhat as unsafe. So I mean, there are like kind of fundamental uh, problems to serializing interactively defined code. And actually, in the documentation of Cloud Pickle, we kind of strive, like, well, sorry, we kind of stress 
uh, the fact that you know clopical is not super safe and that you shouldn't like allow like um, read a clopical um, object uh, if it's not like uh, verified and secure and everything. I'm afraid we don't have the time for any more questions. Um, please, thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Give them a warm. Applause.